Today we're going to look at a nice number theory problem which arises fairly naturally from a really famous result in elementary number theory known as Fermat's Little Theorem. So if you're in and about math YouTube, it's likely that you're familiar with Fermat's Little Theorem, but let's just recall what it says. So it says for all primes p and integers a that are not divisible by p, so they're not multiples of p, we have a to the power p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. So Fermat's little theorem has lots of nice like applications within mathematics and applications outside of mathematics. In fact, a lot of crypto systems, well, cryptography systems for which internet security is based are kind of like proven to be verifiably correct with Fermat's little theorem. Okay, so anyway, let's take this equation right here, which is the conclusion of Fermat's little theorem, and work with a little bit. So let's notice if a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod p, that means that p divides a to the p minus 1 minus 1. That's just by the definition of congruence mod p. Maybe if we really wanted to, we could recall that we say x is congruent to y modulo n, if you will, if and only if n divides x minus y. In other words, x minus y is a multiple of n. Okay, but if p divides a to the p minus 1, then that means we can write a to the p minus 1 minus 1 as m times p, so a multiple of p. See what I did there with the m times p? Okay, but next up we could divide by p and we'll have the following formula a to the p minus 1 minus 1 over p is equal to m, where m is in fact an integer. I guess I should have put up here that m is an integer. That follows from the definition of divisibility though. So that's pretty cool. This object right here is always an integer. For some reason, since this is like stated more simply without like the structure or the machinery of congruence mod p, it looks a little bit more surprising in this form, but it's exactly the same. But if this kind of thing is an integer, then we'd like to ask some questions like what values of a and p make this certain types of integers? And then that's exactly what today's problem's about. So the problem is to find all primes p so that 2 to the p minus 1 minus 1 over p is a perfect square. So here we've replaced a with 2. I guess a super general version of this problem would be to find all pairs a and p that make this quotient right here a perfect square, but that sounds very hard. So we're going to stick with this case first. Hey there, I see you, the unsubscribed viewer. According to our YouTube analytics, most of our watch time comes from people that are not subscribed. What is that about? If you're watching this video and you have not subscribed yet, I'll make sure we pause this part of the video so that you can go subscribe. Great, we're back. Hopefully you've subscribed because the video will not continue if you do not subscribe and you'll trap me here in this video forever. Then I can't make any more content. So hit subscribe and ring that bell so you get notified every time I release a video and so that I'm not stuck here. Okay, now we're ready for our solution. I'd like to point out that I found this on the Math Stack Exchange. Here's the number if you'd like to check out the post. So let's quickly notice that P equals two is not a solution. And that's because that doesn't give us an integer in the first place. And we wouldn't expect it to, given that the Fermat's little theorem is not set up to allow p to be 2. Because remember, p must not divide the number a. And 2 is playing the role of the number a here. 
Okay, so that means that P must be an odd prime, but if P is an odd prime, we can write P as 2n plus 1, where n is bigger than or equal to 1. Notice n equals 1 will give us the prime 3, n equals 2 will give us the prime 5, and so on and so forth. Obviously, not all odd numbers are primes, but all odd prime numbers can be written in this form. Okay, so now let's push this version of p into our equation. That's going to give us 2 to the power 2n minus 1 over, well, it'll be 2n plus 1, but I'm going to leave that as p just because we won't need to replace all of them. I think it's like really helpful to replace this one because now we see this thing up here as a perfect square. This is 2 to the n power squared, and that's a nice simplification. And then we'll have this is equal to x squared for x, which is some natural number. Our goal is for that to be a perfect square, like we said. Okay, so now let's do a little bit of factoring on the left-hand side and a little bit of cross-multiplying to get the p up to the other side. That'll leave us with 2n plus 1 times 2 to the n minus 1 equals p times x squared. And now let's make the following observation, which isn't too hard to prove, and that is that the GCD of 2n plus 1 and 2n minus 1 is equal to 1. In other words, they're relatively prime. And we can easily check that by noticing that if d divides 2 to the n plus 1 and d divides 2 to the n minus 1, in other words, it's a common divisor of those two numbers, then it also must divide their difference. But notice their difference is 2. So that means d divides 2. But if d divides 2, that means that d equals 1 or 2. So any divisor that is a common divisor of these two numbers is either equal to 1 or 2. That being said, both of our numbers are odd, so that means that we must have d equal to 1. It's impossible to have d equal to 2 because, like I said, these two numbers are odd, so you can't have a divisor of 2. Okay, so what does that mean? That's going to break us into two different cases. That'll break us into our first case, which is 2 to the n plus 1 is equal to p times a squared, and 2 to the n minus 1 is equal to b squared. Let's talk our way through this just a little bit. Notice we've got this product of things is equal to a prime times a perfect square. Well, the prime has to be inside one of them as a factor. So this case puts the prime in this first one as a factor. But then since these are relatively prime and what's left over, if you will, is a perfect square, then that means what's left over after the distribution of p among these must be a perfect square in both cases. Again, and that follows because these things are relatively prime. Okay, so like I said, we're with our first case right here. Well, let's investigate this object and see that we get a problem when we're investigating this object. And now let's break this into two subcases. So let's see, I'll branch one off there and one off there. So if n is equal to one, then we have b squared is equal to one, which tells us that b is equal to one. And if b is equal to one, let's see, we'll see that n is also equal to one by this equation right here. But if n is equal to one, p is equal to three. So now we've got a potential solution. Now we have to check if that is actually a solution and we can do that by plugging it into our original equation. So we'll have two to the three minus one minus one over three. Well, that's equal to two to the two, which is four minus one, which is three over three, which is one, which is one squared. So that means, yes, we're good to go. This is a solution. So I'll put a check mark next to it. We've got that is a solution. And now let's look at the other branching path here. And the other branching path in this case will be the case when n is bigger than or equal to 2. 
But let's notice if n is bigger than or equal to two, then this two to the n is a multiple of four. Oh, but now we can reduce mod four and we'll see that b squared is congruent to negative one mod four, but that's the same thing as three modulo four. But that's in fact impossible. So three is not a perfect square mod four and you can check that with just simple multiplication. So zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is four, which is zero mod four, three squared is nine, which is one mod four. And those are all possible residues squared mod four and we never achieved the number three. So this gives us no solution. So this path was not fruitful, whereas this path right here gave us our first solution. Okay, so this was our first case where we distributed the p to this 2n plus 1 term. Now let's look at the second case where we distribute the n to the other term, or the p to the other term. So we'll have 2 to the n plus 1 is equal to a squared, and then we'll have 2 to the n minus 1 is equal to p times b squared. And now we're gonna work off of this two to the n plus one equals a squared. And note that tells us that a squared minus one is two to the n, but then we can factor a minus one times a plus one is equal to two to the n. But if the product of those two things is a power of two, then each one is a power of two. So for instance, maybe we would have a minus one is equal to two to the c, and a plus one is equal to two to the d. Again, if a product equals a power of two, then each term has to be a power of two, just by like prime factorizations and the such. But now we could perhaps subtract those two equations and we'll get two is equal to two to the D minus two to the C. But now we wanna look for all powers of two that are separated by two units. Well, there's only one case that that ever happens, and that's the case when d is equal to two and c is equal to one. Otherwise, the powers of two are separated by more than two. Okay, so we've got d is equal to two and c is equal to one. So now pulling that all the way back into what p would be, we'll have that p is equal to seven. And that's just a matter of substituting back into all of the variables that we've built along the way. So we've got p is equal to seven. And now I guess we have to check that works as well. Let's maybe do that up here. So we'll have two to the six minus one over seven. But two to the six is 64, minus one is 63 over seven, but that's nine, which is three squared. So this over here is indeed another solution. And along the way, those are really the only choices that were left to us. So those are all of the solutions. Now, if you like problems like this and number theory, I've got a whole course on number theory that's ad-free on my second channel, Math Major. You might say, well, how do we keep this ad-free? And it's by Patreon. So if you'd like to support us keeping ad-free educational content on the second channel, consider joining the Patreon. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.